that door. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, State Representative Gene Wu. I represent House District 137 in Southwest Houston. Uh, and uh, we're having a press conference here today to talk about the status of our effort to uh, raise the age. Uh, and this is relating to uh, changing the juvenile cutoff age for, um, uh, for criminal courts. Um, but first, I would like to start out by really uh, commending State Representative um, Sylvester Turner and the fabulous work that he's done over the years, and especially on Senate Bill 1630, and also John Whitmire, who is the author of Senate Bill 1630. You know, this, um, if, if, this is the bill that we attached our amendment to, to, uh, to raise the age. And this is a bill that was fundamentally one of the most important uh, reforms of the juvenile justice system in the last probably 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's going to make a huge significant huge significant difference to our uh, juvenile population and especially to our courts. Um, and, you know, and John Whitmire, Senator Whitmire and Representative Turner have been instrumental in many other key pieces of legislation, including decriminalizing uh, truancy that also has passed, is on the way to the governor's desk. Uh, we decriminalize uh, just basic student mis shenanigans and behaviors in the classrooms last time. And overall, what we're trying to do is maintain this momentum of taking kids out of the criminal justice system. That we want to treat kids as kids. We want them to have a chance to make mistakes, to learn, and to grow from it. And not be saddled with something that affects their, their lives, you know, from then on because of one mistake. So with that being said, I want to, and, and uh, on behalf of many advocates who are here, express our, you know, our deep disappointment that our amendment to uh, 16, Senate Bill 1630 was stripped out in press in com conference committee. Now, we understood that this six, Senate Bill 1630 was a very important piece of reform legislation, uh, and we didn't want to jeopardize it. But I did not sign the conference committee report in in sort of a symbolic protest of not having the amendment left on uh, the bill itself, and. While this is not a well-known issue outside of the criminal justice world and outside of uh, the people who study this and advocate for this, this issue, this is a very important issue for Texas. And the reason is this. We spend a lot of time on this House floor and on the Senate floor talking about how to break the prison pipeline, how to stop sending our, our people to prison where their lives are ruined forever. What we want to do with Raise the Age is basically give kids a chance to learn, to make mistakes, but yet to grow from it and not have their lives completely ruined because of one small mistake. And having convictions in an adult system could mean that a, that a child, that a young person, has on their record something that will prevent them from going to school, prevent them from getting a job, and prevent them from even renting an apartment. And that could be as simple as something as a small possession of marijuana. Having that on your record as an adult follows you for the rest of your life and will prevent you from doing all the things I just talked about. And with that, we want to thank Senator Whitmire because he has committed to us that he will <coughs> study this in the interim. He says, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And we applaud that. And we want to make sure that this issue stays on the forefront because it's not only the right thing to do for our counties, for our state, for our finances, but it is just simply morally and judicially the right thing to do. And with that, I'll hand it off to my colleagues. Let me, uh, let me, I am State Representative Sylvester Turner, District 139. Let me certainly, first of all, just acknowledge uh, the work that Representative Wu uh, did on this, on this particular amendment. Uh, it was through uh, his efforts uh, that this issue came to the forefront. It was through his, uh, his uh, arguments on the Texas floor 
uh, convince a strong majority, <coughs> majority of the members uh, to vote for this issue. I, I agree with everything that he said. 18-year-olds um, or 17-year-olds, let me say, uh, they cannot vote, uh, they can't really drink, um, they can't serve in our military, uh, and yet we run the risk of them being uh, certified or as adults and go to our uh, to TDCJ. Uh, so I think what uh, Representative Wu did in this amendment was good. Uh, I would tell you, I would certainly, <clears throat> and I support it. Let me just put it that way. I support it 100 uh, percent, and would love to have kept the amendment on 16 on 1630. Um, but I do think, uh, to Representative Wu, to the other members, to the advocates here, uh, that it is an idea whose time has come. Uh, and in talking with Representative Larry Phillips, for example, uh, uh, who signed the report, uh, they ended up taking the amendment off. He too agreed. Uh, that it will happen uh, and believe that in the next session it will, it will occur. And so the amendment certainly helped to move uh, the argument forward. I've, I've visited uh, with Senator Whitmire. Uh, he too uh, has agreed to highlight this issue through the interim and I think to move, to move in this direction. And so um, I think it's the right thing to do. I, I think the time to do it, quite frankly, is now. Uh, it won't happen in this legislative session, uh, but it's my hope and I believe in all probability it will take place in the next legislative ses session. Priya is telling us, the feds are telling us we need to do it anyway. Okay? Now, though, and, and, I, and I want people to understand what the amendment did. The amendment simply said that it would not take effect until September 1st of 2017 and that the counties would not have to implement it unless the, uh, the state provided the funding. So no funding, no implementation. Uh, but even with that, I think there were some uh, at the county level who didn't quite understand uh, the amendment itself and the fact that the implementation wasn't going to take place until September 1st of 2017 and they didn't have to do it without the funding. But based on PREA, uh, based on the fact uh, that uh, this is the right thing to do, I am a strong believer that it will take place. So again, Representative Wu, thank you for your efforts, for your leadership, and I know you will be around in the next legislative session to bring it into fruition. Well, first of all, thank you all very much for having us this afternoon. I'm State Representative White, House District 19 in Southeast Texas, and definitely want to thank um, Chairman Turner uh, for all of his efforts over the last few decades on the field of criminal justice. And I'm extremely proud and honored to have the practical and useful wisdom of a former prosecutor, a former prosecutor of juvenile justice um, on this team. And uh, yes, it is a disappointment that this amendment, the Wu Amendment on SB 1630, uh, did not remain. And let me tell you why, extending on the remarks from Sylvester Turner. Uh, that amendment uh, by Representative Wu would have provided policymakers and advocates and those in the field with the information they need in order to do the implementation. So even though I am extremely um, hopeful and glad that uh, legislative partners will study this again in the interim. Uh, as we were studying it in the interim, it would, uh, it would be beneficial to have had that practical feel um, analysis going on in a, a parallel as we go back into the next session in 2017. So we will continue the work. Uh, this is a research-driven data-driven process, and the research and data tells us this is the appropriate course to take because um, conditioning young people uh, in our adult prisons uh, is not efficient as far as cost and definitely not effective and compassionate for the families and the children and the community um, involved. So with that, I will turn this over to uh, Representative Wu and he has some other guests for you. And, and to, make, to be very clear about this, we want to make sure that this is very, it's known that this is a bipartisan effort. It's not just Democrats on here, it's not, uh, not just Republicans, but this is a bipartisan effort. It's not just on the behalf of the legislators, but also on the advocacy groups. And we, we will brought at least two of the most vocal advocacy groups uh, that have been through this. Um, there literally have been dozens and dozens of other advocacy groups from, from all sorts, including the, uh, the Texas Association of Sheriffs, the uh, Texas Association of Business, um, 
you know, a wide range of groups, but we can't bring them all in here today, but so we'll have two of the most vocal come and say a few words. Thank you, Representative Wu. Good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Carrillo and I'm a policy researcher with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition. We are a local nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing reform in both the arenas of criminal and juvenile justice. I'd like to thank a moment to take representative to thank Representative Wu and his colleagues in the House of Representatives for putting forth and strongly supporting legislation that aims to improve the chances of success for Texas teens by raising the maximum age of juvenile jurisdiction from 17 to 18. It is with great gratitude and yet great sorrow that I stand here today. You see, for almost a decade, TCJC has worked closely with our partners in the community, with legislators, with practitioners, and with youth and their families to raise awareness of the collateral consequences and dangers associated with serving youth in our adult criminal justice system. Lifetime criminal records, increased chances of reoffending, and exposure to physically and sexually violent conditions of confinement are all risks that we believe should not be taken with our youth. When the vast majority of these teens are being arrested, charged, and sentenced for minor and nonviolent offenses, we cannot help but stop and wonder, are the benefits really outweighing the costs? That is, is it worth jeopardizing the lives of tens of thousands of youth simply to stand by more than a century-old rule that categorizes us as tough on crime? We think not. In the age of research and data-driven solutions, TCJC would like to encourage policymakers to be smart on crime and to ensure that our taxpayer dollars are being dedicated to efforts to, that have proven to be effective in helping teens from, veer from a path of delinquency and crime and onto a path towards success. Among those, of course, are keeping 17-year-olds in the juvenile justice system, where they are afforded the right to treatment, to parental involvement, and to services that are meant to help them in reaching their goals. Though we were not successful in our last minute efforts to make this change, we believe that the wide bipartisan support expressed by the House of Representatives and among our colleagues is an indication that the time for this change is now. Until we meet under this Granite Dome in 2017, we at TCJC will be dedicating our time to helping communities, practitioners, and legislators in moving this much needed change forward. Again, we would like to thank Representative Wu and his colleagues for the stand they took for Texans teens, and we'd like them and everyone to know that we stand in that same corner. Thank you, Representative Wu. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you, Representative, for inviting us here today. Um, just like to make a couple of brief remarks, my name is Derek Cohen. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst in the Center for Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a conservative think tank uh, that supports free market ideals, liberty, and personal accountability. And we support uh, Raise the Age in the Abstract. Uh, the case for raising the age of the juvenile court jurisdiction is one of sufficiency. As we all have uh, apocryphal tales I'm sure we can relate to, uh, the juvenile brain simply is not as good at making decisions as that of the adult. Now, when we talk about how we're going to punish these uh, indecisions, we'll say, uh, raising the age would not actually eliminate criminal culpability, would not actually eliminate punishment. What it would do is it would improve punishment by ensuring that the juveniles who are punished are done so in the most appropriate venue that gets the most effective uh, short and long-term uh, outcomes. So the the analogy that you hear commonly is that the juvenile brain is basically a, a powerful sports car with shoddy brakes. And this is an apt metaphor because any sort of development of executive function tends to lag behind uh, that which drives impulse. So in other words, uh, this poses a, a, a fundamentally uh, problematic area for the law since uh, we have this m greater likelihood of youthful deviance but we also have this amenability to rehabilitation that starts to close itself off as the offender gets older and older and older. So here's actually what we know about uh, keeping juveniles in adult jurisdiction. We know that in comparative cohort analyses that youth handled in juvenile systems are almost near half as likely to reoffend as those that are kept in um, adult facilities, and this is even with a longer follow-up. Uh, we know that in adult facilities, juveniles are far more likely to fall victim to violence. We know that states that have moved in this direction have experienced costs associated with it far 
uh, less than they actually anticipated. And they also produce a greater reduction in recidivism, which actually compounds those savings. Uh, we also know that failure to address this, as mentioned by uh, both the representative and by Jennifer, Failure to, failure to address this poses additional civil liability. Uh, states, the state here and the counties uh, face additional risk for, to be sued simply by holding juveniles and adults in similar facilities, uh, simply due to compliance with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. So in failing to make this adjustment, uh, we are actually committing and recommitting ourselves to dealing with repeat criminality time and again. Uh, that's not conservative governance. That's actually fairly wasteful. If we do this right uh, and do this up front the first time, I think we'll be in a uh, much better spot. And I think that the, the cost estimates and the recidivism estimates um, will both pleasantly surprise us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you answer any questions, if, if there are any. Yes. Right. This is kind of what's happened here, I uh, see. So, how does this change your mind? Uh, in the past, it's been said that it will take six years minimum right. to facilitate this type of change. Is there another approach that y'all consider in the next legislative session? You know, I, I think that there's been a lot of people who have thrown out sort of uh, the, the apocalypse scenarios of, you know, it'll take so much, it'll take like a, a bazillion dollars, it'll take, you know, a decade to implement. If you talk to the advocates, if you talk to people who study this for a living, if you talk to people who have studied this issue for the last 20 years, they say, no, it won't. It will not cost that much money. It will not take that much time. You know, this is not, uh, this is going to be a major policy change, but this will not turn, turn the world upside down for prosecution or for law enforcement. Uh, you're simply taking someone who otherwise would have been taken to the county jail and you take them to juvenile probation instead. That's it. Um, we actually predict that this would actually decrease the number of people in custody because a lot of the 17-year-olds, if you're busting them for marijuana, you're busting them for petty theft, if they were adults, we would throw them in county jail until they could bond out. If they were juveniles, we would send them home. We know where they live. We'll come pick you up on your next court date. So you, have, you would actually have fewer people in jail. And even in places like Harris County, Many of the juveniles that would have been charged as, a, that, that as adults would have been charged and, and would have been placed in jail, they wouldn't even be charged as juveniles. They wouldn't even get filed on, as, as the term goes. They would simply be put into a program. So if it's for a petty theft, if it's for small amounts of marijuana, they would be put into treatment programs. So we expect that if this went into place, there would be an overall savings in the long run. That's number one. Number two. The difference between now and the past is now there is a perfect storm of events that are occurring. One, the number of juveniles being arrested is at its lowest point in our history. The number of juveniles being arrested every year has reached a record low. So if we were to make this change now, this would be the cheapest and most efficient time to do it. If the juvenile numbers go back up later, we would have squandered this opportunity. Number two, there is a confluence of advocacies, advocates from both sides who have now said, look, we've studied this issue across two decades, and we know for a fact that if juveniles are treated in a juvenile system as opposed to an adult system, the results are much, much better. And three, the last thing is, of course, PREA. The Federal uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act re almost basically almost requires that we make this change. And by not making a chain, this change, we're going to subject our counties and the state to potentially pretty expensive lawsuits. Um, so we're, well, that's one of the bigger reasons we're really trying to hope to get it done this session to sort of avoid that potential liability uh, in the upcoming years. Right. So the people who have, uh, have taken a look at this issue support it. The people who have an understanding of why it's being done and, and the necessity of doing it understand it uh, wholeheartedly. The people who are opposed it generally, I think, have a 
you know, well, 17-year-olds, they, they know it's wrong. You know, and that's sort of mentality of, well, let's just go, go hammer them. You know, and the thing is, what we try to tell people is, look, 17-year-olds don't behave like adults. If you look at the types of crimes committed by 17-year-olds, I think the, the 2013 numbers were 93 or 96 Ninety-six percent of the crimes committed by 17-year-olds in Texas were for non-violent offenses and misdemeanors. Again, having a little bit of pot, stealing a case of beer, you know, you know, toilet papering somebody's house, things like that. So only three percent were for violent crimes or felonies, or higher-level felonies. And you know what? Those those three percent can be certified as adults any time. I think, you know, I, I don't want to put words in uh, the senator's mouth, and I think what, uh, what I think he is talking about is what does implementation look like? I think that the studies in the past have talked about should we do this or not. I think there is an agreement among the, the stakeholders and among the advocates, yes, this should be done. The question is how much money will it take, what changes have to be done, what rules have to be re re rewritten. And I think that's, that's a fair and that's, I think that's a legitimate uh, question to ask, I think, um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I think my amendment to the bill would have solved that because it would have pushed implement, implementation out two years past the next legislative session, and we stated in the amendment, hey, if we don't give you guys money, we don't, get, we don't have to do this. So that's the best, I mean, that's, that's the best possible world for, for uh, legislation. Is there any money in the budget for that? And, and I, I think absolutely yes. And here's, here's the reason why. And you know, I've heard numbers as high as 100 million, but if you talk to the people who are in the know, they say, no, that's, that's way too high. Because, for example, Harris County, Harris County's people have told me, well, we're gonna have to spend $40 million to build a whole new facility to house, 100, to house 300 new people, new, new, new juveniles. Well, the current juvenile facility houses 300. So, you know, you're saying that you're gonna have to double your capacity to add one more age range? for one more years of uh, kids. And I think there's an argument about which numbers are right or wrong. And I think the, here's the thing is, if they were adults and we had to arrest every single one of them and put them in jail, then yes, you would need you know, 300 new beds. But as juveniles, as we treat juveniles now, if they're busted for small amounts of marijuana, if they're busted for petty theft, petty criminal mischief, um, disorderly conduct, we would never arrest them and throw them in jail. So why do we need those 300 beds? And I think that's the argument that we're trying to have with, with a lot of the counties, with a lot of the uh, prosecutor's office and the sheriff's office, is that, look, it's not the apocalypse. We can do this, we can do it cheaply, and we can do it quickly. How far did this effort go last session? Um, not as far as it did this time. So I think this is the, the nature of uh, Texas legislation that uh, we're a very conservative state and not only conservative in our thoughts but conservative in our actions as well. So legislation takes time to move forward each time this piece of legislation has pushed ahead just a little bit and I think this is as far as we ever have gotten it. I mean the, um, and I was actually quite surprised by our vote on the floor. When we put the amendment on it was voted on by uh, 87 to 50 votes or something like that. That's. Uh, that wasn't a narrow victory. That was a fairly significant number of people voted for it. So that gave us, gives us a lot of hope, and I think that sent a clear message that this body is ready for this change. Okay. Thank you all very much. And we do have a um, written press release inside the little uh, green folders. And thank you so much to my, uh, my legislative uh, assistant, uh, Andy Gentile. She's the one who did a lot of this stuff, and I... And we have a lot of the advocates outside. If you guys want to talk to some of the other advocates, they've been, they've been wanting to talk to people and talk about this for a long time.